just want to welcome everyone that's jumping into the webinar right now. We're going to wait a couple seconds for everyone to get in here, and then we'll get started with everything. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, all. My name is Sandra Figueroa. I'm with HSRC here at the University of North Carolina at Cap uh, Chapel Hill. I'm happy to welcome everyone and all of our participants and panelists to today's installment of our PBIC webinar series. Today's webinar will feature part one of our e-scooter and micromobility safety webinar series while highlighting research, tools, and guidance within the field. The first group of panelists will be from FHWA sharing a presentation titled Serving All People, All Abilities. The second group of panelists will be providing their project overview and findings from the Behavioral Traffic Safety Cooperative Research Program, BTS 10 project, which highlights e-scooter safety um, issues and solutions. I'm excited to provide a brief bio of each of the panelists joining us today. Bronwyn Kiner is a transportation set, uh, specialist with the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Human Environment, where she leads the US DOT Micromobility Working Group and supports the National Systems and Economic Development Team on a range of activities, including scenic byways, economic development, curbside management, mobility innovations, rural communities, and transit-oriented development. Christopher Dowis is a community planner with the Federal Highway Administration in Washington, DC. He has managed the recreational trails program since 1992, transportation enhancement activities and transportation alternatives since 2003, and has assisted with bicycle and pedestrian activities since 1992. He manages contracts for research, technology development, technical assistance, and trails or er, training for trail and bicycle and pedestrian related activities. Bernadette DuPont is a civil engineer and serves as a transportation specialist at the Federal Highway Administration. She joined the Office of Human Environment's Livability Team in 2022 and works on a range of active transportation, health, equity, and research initiatives. Bernadette joined the FHWA Kentucky Division Office in 2001, where she served as a research coordinator, senior planner, freight specialist, and air quality specialist. Prior to that, Bernadette served as a research engineer for the Kentucky Transportation Center at the University of Kentucky. Bernadette holds an MSCE, BSCE, MBA in telecommunications and an environmental system certificate from the University of Kentucky. Dr. Laura Sant is the co-director of the UNC Highway Safety Research Center, where she focuses on research strategy and implementation. She's active in a variety of research areas, including the development and evaluation of community-involved health and injury prevention programs, and studies focusing on pedestrian and bicycle safety, mobility, and access. Dr. Rebecca Sanders is the founder and principal investigator of Safe Streets Research and Consulting. She has dedicated her 17-year career to studying transportation safety with a particular focus on people walking, bicycling, and using micromobility. Her research covers a broad range of topics related to pedestrian, bicyclists, and e-scooter safety, including nighttime risk, fatality hotspots, roadway design preferences, and the relationship between near misses, perceived safety, and crashes. Her work has played a key role in national policy and design guidance. Dr. Chris Cherry is a professor at the University of Tennessee. His research interests include bicycle and pedestrian safety and system design, the role of e-bikes, micromobility, and other emerging technologies on the transportation system, multimodal transportation planning and economics, travel behavior and demand, and sustainable transportation and transit security. 
Just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Attendees, you are in a listen-in mode, but you can still communicate with us using the Q&A pane at the bottom of the Zoom win webinar window. We've built in some time at the end of today's webinar uh, for a discussion period with our panelists. So we will try to integrate the questions that we receive in the Q&A section, um, but please submit them at any time throughout the presentations. The webinar is being archived at www.pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars. That includes a copy of the slides, which are in the process of being posted, and a video recording, which should be available by tomorrow. This webinar is eligible for certain certificates and professional development hours. We will be providing everyone with a link to download a certificate of attendance following the completion of a post-webinar questionnaire. A follow-up email will contain more details about all of this, so look for that in your inbox. As always, we encourage you to check out our recorded webinars and sign up for future episodes. I would now like to go ahead and turn over our presentation to our folks from FHWA. Thank you so much, Sandro. Great introduction. My slides now. My name is Bronwyn Kiner, and I'm a transportation specialist with the Office of Human Environment at Federal Highway Administration. And I'm joined today by my colleagues, Christopher Dowis and Bernadette DuPont. Really excited to be here for this two-part webinar series on e-scooter safety. And want to thank the partners at PBIC for putting this series on. I um, also want to thank the panelists who will be reporting on their research findings, and all of you today uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedules. As this a rapidly growing mode of transportation endures, it's ever more important to understand and shape our collective safety efforts. Bottom line at Federal Highway Administration is we want to have a safe, accessible, equitable, and comfortable transportation infrastructure that's usable by all ages and all abilities. So today, Bernadette, Christopher, and I will start the topic and share a few updates on where we're at with micromobility at the federal level, and then we'll turn it back over to our partners at UNC Highway Research Center. Just a quick disclaimer, I do have to say as a representative of the federal agency, uh, the US government does not endorse outside entities, products, or manufacturers, and some links to content are um, by outside entities or just provided for informational purposes only. So starting off with just a broad overview of the shared micromobility growth landscape, it's just been incredible to watch how it has quickly evolved over the last decade. Although docked bike share has been around in the US since 2008, it wasn't until 2018 that shared micromobility took off. In 2018, there were 84 million trips taken across North America and micromobility trips grew again in 2019 with 136 million trips. Trips declined in 2020 due to COVID, but in 2021, they rose again to under, over 128 million trips. In 2022, micromobility rose again with over 157 million trips across North America, and we anticipate the 2023 data will show continued growth. There were also 363 cities across the U.S. that had bike share or scooter sh share systems, and docked bike share continued to grow throughout 2023 up till today. So at USDOT and FHWA, we're shifting to an equity approach, and the department recently published the 2023 update of the Equity Action Plan. Uh, we have a shared goal of institutionalizing equity in the department and the agency. And what that means is the incorporation of a robust definition of equity as reflected in this infographic by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, we're recognizing the needs of all ages and abilities and across all of the community types that we serve. So our commitments to equity are centered in the needs of all users and those include those that use and need micromobility. So at the federal level, our role is to continue to support micromobility as a viable transportation mode, and we hope to move the needle in our efforts to promote transportation equity, which seeks to achieve fairness in terms of providing mobility and access to meet the needs of all populations. So how do we define micromobility at the federal level? FHWA's definition refers to any small, low-speed, human or electric-powered transportation device, including bikes, scooters, e-bikes, e-scooters, and other small lightweight wheeled conveniences that people use to get to and from a de destination. This definition builds on uh, the Society of Automotive Engineers International Taxonomy of Powered Micromobility Devices, but our definition includes human-powered devices and bicycles, and this is largely to FHWA's focus on infrastructure from the design and shared space point of view. 
point of clarification, when we refer to micromobility, we're commonly talking about shared micromobility. So that's any docked or dockless fleets of micromobility devices that are available for a shared or public use. And today there are a wide range of micromobility devices evolving all over the world. They're changing the dynamics of our entire transportation system and expanding what's possible for people to get from point A to point B, connecting to first and last mile. And it's not just in cities, but in rural areas and suburban areas, opening up new options for people that are traveling longer distances. And likewise, street spaces are evolving today and cities are becoming increasingly creative in allocating space and designing in other lanes as more and more devices compete for curb space. So uses of curb space offer challenges in considering accessibility, delivery access, and micromobility devices all at the same time. There's often a competition for curb space. We've just got a lot of things going on at the curb. So safety is another major consideration there as well. And in terms of the federal role, in general, most regulation of micromobility use in the U.S. takes place at the state and local level, not the national level. State and local governments establish micromobility usage and safety policies as they relate to where to ride, age restrictions, license or ID, helmets and lighting, speed and parking regulations. <clears throat> federal laws prohibit some motorized vehicles on non-motorized trails and pedestrian walkways using certain federal funding. For example, federal land management agencies such as the National Park Service regulate the classes of e-bikes allowed on federal lands, but mostly it's done at the state and local levels and micromobility providers also stipulate their own guidelines and operating instructions. I'll turn it over to Bernadette for the next slide. There we go. Thank you, Bronwyn. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I wanted to spend a little time highlighting the climate sustainability, health, and environmental benefits of micromobility. Federal Highway recognizes the critical importance that micromobility and active transportation modes play in responding to climate change, both in mitigating its increasing impacts and helping our communities adapt and become increasingly resilient. That's why our strategic plan I uh, set a goal to increase participation in all sustainable transportation modes by 50% by 2026. Uh, mode shifts away from cars to micromobility devices not only reduces traffic congestion and lowers personal stress, you know, from sitting in traffic, but it can also have a major environmental justice benefits for disadvantaged communities because they're often uh, located near major highways and can be disproportionately subjected to air pollutants. According to the North American Bike Share and Scooter Share Association, uh, in, in their 2022 State of the Industry Report, 37% of shared micromobility trips replaced a car trip in 2022. Um, the exciting thing from an environmental perspective is that these trips offset approximately 74 million pounds of carbon dioxide emissions, which is equal to 101.36 tons per day of carbon dioxide in the United States. Uh, the reports also found that um, shared micromobility can save the equivalent of 2.3 billion, with the B, gall gallons of gasoline per year. That's a lot. So when you're using micromobility, you're improving health outcomes and air quality and physical health through active transportation, all at the same time. Not only that, but micromobility increases mobility options because it enhances first and last mile connections to public transit, generates new revenue for cities and provides a greater return on investment. By utilizing cycling infrastructure, micromobility can move many people and it is much like, less costly and time consuming to build than vehicle lanes. Next slide, please. Another thing we wanted to talk about today are the safety considerations. Safety is Federal Highway's guidance star, and it has been for a long time. Um, we have a great challenge in front of us when it comes to safety, and we can do better by better integrating micromobility into our existing transportation system. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do to save lives. Uh, the need for enforcement is greatly reduced when there's sufficient planning and education for safety. Uh, the items listed on the left are some of the safety considerations cities should consider when designing for safe micromobility systems. 
the Federal Highway Office of Safety has developed several proven safety countermeasures for pedestrians and bicyclists, which have applicability to micromobility users as well. Uh, a list of those is on the right-hand side in that square. And I know you probably can't read it. So bicycle lanes, creating bicycle lanes, or medians and pedestrian refuge islands in urban and suburban areas, or installation of, or changing from the roadway configuration from maybe perhaps a four lane to a three lane road with one of those lanes being a turning lane. Uh, that's what we call a road diet or making enhancements to crosswalk visibility or installing pedestrian hybrid beacons or installing walkways, sidewalks. Um, the last two are probably um, providing a leading pedestrian interval when you're crossing the street, giving a few extra seconds of time so that they can cross safely without any interfix interference from vehicles. And of course, I don't know if you've seen them or not, but there's rectangular rapid flashing beacons. So those are very important. But it takes all of us to, to help solve a safety crisis. Um, our team at the Federal Highway Administration's Office of Safety found that in 19... 20, um, 19, 2021, <laughs> pedestrian and cyclist crashes accounted for 20% of the fatalities. Um, sidewalks can reduce those crashes by 89% and adding bicycle lanes can reduce those crashes by 49%. So those safety countermeasures are really important and you can tell by those numbers that they're very effective. Next slide, please. Another key thing to note as it relates to safety is that complete streets for all users is our default approach. As we work with every federal highway stakeholder to deploy complete streets approaches and integrate people and places into the planning, design, construction, operation, and maintenance of our transportation networks, we can ensure that streets put safety over speed, balance the needs of different modes, and support local land uses, economies, cultures, and natural environments. Next slide, please. A related concept that you might not have heard about too often, but it's called a mobility hub. Like complete streets, um, mobility hubs aim to accommodate all users, but the goal is mobility and access. In the example shown in this slide, it's from Boston. Um, there's multiple modes of transportation which are co-located so that users have more safe, reliable, and convenient travel options. Uh, this past year at Federal Highways, uh, we just completed an internal white paper mobility hubs, and we're continuing that research. Um, if you haven't learned a lot about mobility hubs, but they are powerful tools. They support active transportation, electrification, and equity. And micromobility can play a key role providing first and last mile connections to transportation. Next slide, please. I just want to talk a little bit about the research that's going on. Um, we at USDOT uh, continue to play a role in advancing research on the rapidly evolving field of micromobility. Uh, by leading the efforts to further the state of the practice through new research and promoting collaboration with internal and external uh, stakeholders. Um, our team at Federal Highways and the Office of Planning, Environment, and Realty, um, the Office of Human Environment, we're the lead convener on the topic of micromobility, and we coordinate with the other offices used across USDOT. Uh, we have what we ha an internal micromobility working group, and as such, <clears throat> we help determine the the way that research should be moving forward. Or, you know, we find something within our group that oh, we, that probably needs to be discussed and put forth a lot of new issues. But most recently, we published micromobility regulations and permitting equity and synthesis, uh, which is a research report discussing various approaches to regulations and permitting around the United States and how they advance equitable micromobility systems. Uh, we've also recently launched a new micromobility webpage. And if you haven't seen it yet, it's really worthwhile. It has a lot of valuable information in there. It includes the federal highway definition of micromobility, um, our federal, state, and local roles and responsibilities, and the USDOT and external resources and publications, which include a lot of case studies. So that is uh, a lot of good information. The link is on the webpage there for you. And I will now um, move to my last slide, Advancing Innovation and Bike Ped Research. Uh, on a related note, um, we're advancing innovative pedestrian and bicycle research. And we started a roadmap of activities for the next five years 
and we're calling it the Strategic Agenda for Pedestrian Bicycle Transportation. So it'll be from 2024 through 2028. It's an action-packed, <laughs> action-oriented, <laughs> and includes a general timeline for specific actions around uh, four goal areas, safety, networks, equity, and trips. Um, we've been holding presentations internally and externally with the state DOTs, with a variety of um, federal highway uh, federal counterparts. And we're, our next thing that we're going to be doing is going to the Bike Summit, and we're going to be discussing some of our strategies that we're coming up with and help asking that people who are external stakeholders to help us prioritize those. But once we get um, all that together, that's going to be open for everybody to have a look at. It. And we've also um, just produced the Federal Highways Vulnerable Road User Report to Congress. And we've been doing some vulnerable road user research plan, which identifies our topic areas of interest and calls for more research related to micromobility. Um, the role of micromobility in meeting unmet travel demand for underserved populations. Another thing is its impact on traveler behavior and mode choice. Um, connections to resiliency planning, which we talked about on the very first slide I was talking about, and parking management. Um, we're building international partnerships as well. Uh, we attended the PyArc World Road Congress this past fall, and we presented three sessions in Prague on the topics of interurban cycling infrastructure, social equity, and social accessibility. And uh, one of the new ones that we're working on for this year is a, a gender-inclusive transportation system. And there's more to come in 2024. Uh, Federal Highways also sponsored uh, what we call the Austra Asia <laughs> Report. And uh, it was a research team. They went to Australia and New Zealand, and they came up with a, approaches to producing pedestrian infidelities and serious injury in urban signalized artery roadways and a global benchmarking webinar, uh, which many of you might have already attended, but it was very useful, and we're trying to uh, implement some of those findings into our U.S. system. And lastly, we have a pooled fund study, which focuses on bicycle and pedestrian network planning, safety and design issues. Um, there is traffic control uh, devices and other issues uh, designed by the participants in that pooled fund study. We finalized recommendations on the final round of projects uh, uh, late last year. So... On the next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Christopher Dowas to present, and I'll turn off my camera. Okay, hello, everybody. Uh, so my job is to talk about the bipartisan infrastructure law, which was enacted November 2021. Uh, there are a whole lot of programs that came uh, through this program, including the new micromobility policies in the law that it was uh, there is a new center of excellence on new mobility and automated vehicles. Uh, the, but also the bipartisan infrastructure law, it created a new definition of non-motorized road user, which this is in the uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration section of law. And uh, let's see, hopefully we'll get less of an echo if I speak this way. Um, can you hear me now better? Okay, good. All right. So um, there is a definition which includes electric bicycle, electric scooter, actually includes all-terrain vehicle. How that happened, I don't know. But uh, bicycle and micro-mobility activities are eligible under several discretionary programs. Uh, we have a pedestrian bicycle funding opportunities table, which will be linked in the resources that you will receive at the end. So to answer the question of that keeps coming in, will these slides be available afterwards? Yes, the answer is yes, the answer is yes. So uh, that bicycle pedestrian funding opportunity table, it's on our Federal Highway Administration webpage. Um, and micromobility was added as an eligible activity under both the Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Improvement Program and the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. So. The point is federal highway programs can fund bicycles, e-bikes, shared micromobility docking stations, including for scooters. We pay for capital projects. We do not 
pay for ongoing operations. It doesn't matter how many times you ask me the same question over and over again, you know who you are. Uh, I cannot change what the law does not authorize. So the law does not authorize uh, micromobility operations anywhere under Title 23. Therefore, it is not eligible. So, uh, but you can fund operational improvements. So there is a distinction there. So we're not going to fund your ongoing moving the scooters around or moving the bikes around, but we can fund upgrades to the system to help facilitate that. So, uh, but that all the funds, they are selected through the states. We have, uh, let's see, I already talked about the funding opportunities table. Let's move on to slide 18. Uh, this slide talks about some of the individual programs that are available. Um, I'm responsible for transportation alternative set aside, so I know this one. It is a portion of the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program. It has funds available to provide pedestrian and bicycle facilities, including micromobility is also eligible. Uh, so these funds are made available through the state transportation departments and through the large metropolitan planning organizations. Similarly, the carbon reduction program can fund pedestrian and bicycle projects. Uh, micromobility is, uh, it would be included in part of it if you could demonstrate a carbon reduction benefit. The point behind carbon reduction program is you have to demonstrate a carbon reduction benefit, whereas transportation alternatives is really for any pedestrian and bicycle projects. Um, there was a question in the chat about federal laws prohibiting micromobility devices on certain federal highway funded shared use trails. This was changed in the law where e-bikes for, for most of the federal aid highway program, so with the exception of the recreational trails program, but for most federal aid highway program, e-bikes are now defined according to the people, people for bikes, uh, three categories, um, bikes that meet those definitions may use federal highway funded trails and pedestrian walkways if authorized by the state or the locality. However, the scooters do not were not defined that way in law. So scooters theoretically are not supposed to be allowed on not on off highway facilities or pedestrian walkways that have used federal funds. If you've never used federal funds, the federal law does not apply. But if you do use federal funds, then the federal law applies. Uh, is it workable in reality? I'm not so sure. The issue we have with the recreational trails program is by definition, if it has a motor, including e-bikes, including shared, uh, including scooters, by definition, it is a motorized vehicle and therefore not allowed on a trail that has been, that is for the recreational trails program that is for non-motorized use. Uh, it's up, and we know that it's really not workable. Let's move on. Uh, we have, uh, actually, did we move too far? Did we skip a slide? Um, okay, well, we did four new programs. We're just going to go to discretionary. There are two discretionary programs I want to mention, Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program. We are hoping eventually someday, maybe, that the uh, notice of funding opportunity, which was promised a while ago, will be out someday. Uh, the Safe Streets and Roads for All that is out or that has been out. So that is funding available for any project. The, again, the safety, the uh, you, this the focus here is safety. Let's move to the resources. We have uh, many resources available. These This slide has a whole lot of uh, newsletters from which you can get information, including the PBIC Messenger which is a great source of information. Maybe that's how you got your information. Let's move to the next slide. Um, we also are continuing to do, Bernadette talked about the research that we're doing, but we have guidance available. We have a link here to the proven safety countermeasures and we have ongoing research. So I think at this point we move to the next slide. Am I finished? Yes, I'm finished with my port. So at this point we have finished the federal highway presentation and we go back to Sandra, I believe.
Uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and turn the presentation over to Laura Sant and her group. And this is where we'll go ahead and let Chris Cherry kick things off. Thanks, Laura, for the prompt there. Uh, so uh, first of all, thanks for uh, joining. And what we're trying to do is we're uh, um, going to explain and, and uh, express some of the findings from this uh, BTS 10 project uh, entitled E-Scooter Safety Issues and Solutions. Uh, these are high-level takeaways. There's uh, hundreds of pages, literally, I believe, uh, that, that you can dig into the details. Um, but it was a three-year effort to really investigate some of the um, safety issues around e-scooter use, uh, almost exclusively shared e-scooter use, and um, the uh, Takeaway during just sort of high level context is this is the behavioral transportation safety project. So a lot of it is related to data around behavior, uh, around policies that affect behavior. And uh, the other uh, context of this is it, it occurred uh, from, I guess, 2019 to 2022. So right kind of in the heat of the COVID pandemic. So we were uh, the, the sort of as with a lot of the projects that occurred during that time, uh, there was a lot of things happening. And so uh, we're going to explain sort of how cities uh, dealt with, uh, first of all, high level findings from the research that came out, uh, some of the work we did, and then uh, get into some of the questions related to how cities adapted and adopted different strategies. So next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, First things first, we already kind of talked about this. When we're talking about scooters, we mostly mean the thing on the left. Uh, there's different ways of talking about scooters, but I think by now most people probably on the call know what we mean when we're talking about standing scooters, and these are uh, the like that we see in the shared mobility space. Uh, next slide. Um, we heard a little bit about this earlier. Uh, key takeaway, of course, is, so I won't dwell on this, is that electric scooters kind of eclipsed rapidly even the long tail of bike share growth. Uh, bike share has continued to grow. Um, scooters have grown along with them. There's been some uh, ebbs and flows in scooter use over the last couple of years. Uh, one thing that this chart doesn't highlight, and I think it's really important, is that E-scooter use has grown in a lot of different cities, all ranges of size and scale of cities. Um, so uh, a lot of the bike share growth has happened in four or five major cities, whereas uh, scooter growth has happened in basically dozens of cities. So uh, cities large and small with or without bike infrastructure or biking culture have uh, grown uh, with scooter use here. And you can see that um, uh, from its peak, scooter use, use has come down, uh, but it's uh, on par with uh, the number of bike trips out there in scale. Okay. Uh, again, a lot going on and a lot of fast uh, adoption, which is, which is what prompted uh, this study. Uh, like I said, you can see on this graph, we started this study in about 2019 and you can see the, um, the, the massive kind of slug of scooters that uh, entered the streets then. Um, they've created a lot of issues, a lot of things to think about. So we'll just go forward and, and talk about those in the next slide, okay? So the BTS 10 project includes a lot of activity. Uh, again, you can read all about it. Um, and uh, started with a big literature review. Uh, uh, we did a practitioner survey uh, across 85 different cities, 38 states, looking at different safety practices. Uh, we worked with Populous, uh, and they had a ridership survey that, that was included in the study. Um, we looked at uh, de emergency department data, uh, trying to assess how scooter injuries varied related to bicyclists and pedestrian injuries, and that was in uh, North Carolina. Uh, we did uh, field observations of e-scooter riders and cyclists to see how they operated on the sidewalks or streets and uh, and so on, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then uh, finally, interviews with uh, uh, kind of detailed interviews with 
micromobility program managers. So next slide. So things we learned, this, a lot of this came from, uh, uh, and I'll just focus mostly on the center column here, e-scooter riders. Uh, a lot of this came from the literature that had been published up until that point and, and so and beyond really. Uh, we've updated it a little bit. Um, males are more represented than females, and this varies highly uh, from a demographic perspective. And uh, generally white, generally middle income, generally uh, young adults, um, 18 to 35 year olds. So that's kind of the profile of uh, e-scooter rider. Obviously, that's a very simplistic profile. There's a varied uh, uh, demographic that uses these. Um, riding speed tends to be limited by policy. Uh, some policies like Washington, D.C. cap uh, top speed at 10 miles per hour uh, to 15 miles per hour, some up to 20 miles per hour or 17 miles per hour. Different agencies have different speeds. Um, there's been some recent studies that looked at comparing, for example, uh, Washington, D.C.'s 10 mile per hour uh, speeds uh, relative to Austin's uh, 15, I believe, and, and where people ride uh, on different infrastructure. And we can talk a little bit about that in the questions if we get the, if, if that's an open question. Um, generally, see, uh, the ridership was seasonal, uh, generally similar to bicycles. Uh, helmet use, this is a kind of a known issue, is uh, any shared mobility has lower helmet use for e-scooter riders, especially. Um, and so that's one of the big challenges is trying to um, identify ways to help people wear helmets or be safer with without wearing helmets. OK, um, and then uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, bike facilities over sidewalks uh, in a minute. So we'll skip skip that point uh, next. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, e-scooter rider impairment, there's a lot of discussion about impairment, uh, especially early on, uh, and not as many people were impaired as in the data uh, with some big variations. You know, there was a uh, in San Diego, there was a higher level of impairment than other places uh, for people that were injured uh, or people that were involved in crashes. And so uh, normally, in, in general, single digits um, in terms of impairment of people that were involved in crashes. And the injury profile, this is the kind of an important part here, is that uh, most injuries occur when the scooter rider falls. Uh, and most of the injuries that occur in those cases are hospitalizations where the, the injured rider is uh, treated and and in almost 90% of those cases released. Um, the severe injuries are the ones that occur um, with motor vehicles and, and almost uh, 70 to 80% of all fatal injuries involve a motor vehicle. So that's a really important uh, element to consider. Obviously, uh, reducing risk from falls and in, in, involves making sure that the um, uh, travel ways are clear of cracks and and uh, obstacles that small scooter wheels can be trapped by. Uh, uh, working against uh, injuries related to severe in, uh, vehicle crashes involves kind of different countermeasures related to safe crossing, safe intersections, uh, safe bike lanes, and so on. Okay, next. So uh, high level uh, helmets are important uh, part of the story here. And we hear a lot of uh, that's one of the top uh, elements to talk about. Uh, certainly helmet use would uh, uh, reduce is has a, is a known countermeasure, let's say. Uh, and head injuries are actually a big part of the e-scooter injury profile. This is where a lot of e-scooter injuries are presented at, at hospital. Uh, admissions, or I should say emergency department uh, treatment, uh, 28 to 40 percent of emergency departments are, are looking at head injuries. Um, a lot of the, so skipping to the third bullet point, um, well, sorry, I should say, st stick with that bullet point. A lot of those head injuries uh, are uh, the, the let me just step back uh framing this in in terms of uh head, the location of the injury is important but some of those injuries are traumatic brain injuries uh other ones are abrasions so those are kind of different uh challenges to sort of cut through the data with um 
The most common type of injury were fractures to arms and wrists. So kind of uh, uh, dealing with the nuance of uh, head injuries versus arm and wrist fractures, uh, these so-called life-altering injuries that might cause severe uh, brain trauma and so on, and so on uh, relative to uh, uh, cuts and, and other abrasions on, on heads is an important uh, distinction. Um, Severity tends to be low uh, in general. Uh, you, of the emergency department visits, uh, there's different ways of classifying those as severe. About 10% are severe in emergency department visits, meaning, for example, requiring some admission to a hospital. Um, looking just uh, quickly at pedestrians, uh, there's a highlight here that about half of pedestrians that end up in a, in one state uh, end up in the hospital uh, rely on publicly funded healthcare programs. Um, similarly, uh, if uh, scooter injuries are occurring and uh, with low helmet use, then it could be there could be a burden uh, on the public health care system related to that. Okay, next. <clears throat> so uh, we I think. Uh, Folks on the line here uh, know this, so I don't have to dwell too much on it, but some of the major risk factors of scooter riders uh, is associated with uh, uneven pavements and, uh, and um, obstacles that can tend to be uh, relatively benign to maybe a bicyclist, but cause severe harm to a scooter rider who has kind of different, uh, the scooters tend to have different ride worthiness because of smaller wheels and uh, different kinds of sort of uh, rider posture and the like. Okay, so uh, falls are, become, are a big issue with scooter riders uh, in this type of infrastructure. Next. Uh, a couple of other things that I wanted to, that we wanted to highlight here is that we also hear uh, a lot of uh, uh, stories about wrong way riding, about uh, tandem riding or uh, double riders like you see on the right-hand side, um, uh, people being irresponsible and uh, uh, trying to have too much fun, you might say, uh, hopping curbs and doing that sort of thing. Um, inexperience, I think, is an important uh, element to think about also. Um, if the a lot of these uh, scooter riders are not seasoned bicyclists, for example, so they don't maybe know the rule, rules of the road, uh, navigation by bicycle or by scooter may be different, and so on. Um, there's a question about impatience, about impairment, and of course, riders without helmets. Um, we hear a lot about these things. We don't really, we still really don't know the the extent to which they're. Um, they may be highly visible, but to the extent they're actually dangerous. Um, we do know sidewalk riding, for example, is a big part of the, the risk factor for uh, e-scooter riders. Okay, next. So one of the things we did, and uh, just quickly here, um, we did uh, try a trial essentially, and, and we actually collected a good bit of data on uh, e-scooter rider behavior in two different cities in Nashville and in Portland. And so here you have, what is that, 27 sites, different intersections or corridors, you might say. We could see, had a pretty good view. We varied uh, the types of infrastructure that we could see uh, and the kind of cross section of the roadway to get a varied type of infrastructure. And in all cases, these were uh, places that had generally high levels of e-scooter ridership based on the sort of big data that we had. So um, we uh, ended up with 500 and some hours of video at all nights of day, all times of day and night, uh, which it was able to capture the 4 a.m. rides and those sorts of things. And, uh, and we were able to uh, extract some meaningful information from that. Uh, I'll, uh, next slide, Laura. Thanks. Uh, not, not a lot of time to dive into the details, so I won't, but you can actually um, uh, see some of this in a TRB meeting and you can uh, reach out to me, uh, TRB paper. Uh, you can reach out to me if you want more info on that. Uh, but uh, high level, let's just look at the, the one of the things that we care a lot about is sidewalk riding. We have so much effort focused on uh, reducing sidewalk riding. 
So for both Nashville and uh, Portland, uh, I'll focus on the top panel there, which is our e-scooter riders. One of the things we wanted to do is compare e-scooter riders to bicyclists. And so for the top panel, we look at e-scooter riders and two types of streets, a high volume street and a low volume set of streets, I should say. And uh, those with bike lanes and without bike lanes. Mm -hmm. And you can see without a bike lane on a high volume street, like an arterial e-scooter rider, 73% of them use the sidewalk, which is uh, kind of what you would, uh, what we see out there. Uh, low volume streets, uh, only 34% use sidewalks. So this adds kind of more credence to some of the early Portland studies that did small observational uh, studies that looked at these sort of questions. When you have a bike lane, uh, that number of people that ride on the sidewalk uh, for high volume streets drops from 73% to 22%. Uh, likewise, for low volume streets, even on low volume streets, sidewalk usage goes from 34% down to 12%. So of all the things that we noticed, this was the most striking uh, approach. I think the difference that we saw was that, uh, as we know, as we all suspect, and, and this is some kind of hard evidence that shows that just sidewalk, uh, for all of the messaging that you might see on the right-hand side, the uh, a lot of it is sidewalk-related messaging and educational campaigns. The thing that really matters is design uh, and then uh, making sure that our designs are uh, supportive of the things we want people to do, like ride in bike lanes and not on sidewalks. And I have this example on the bottom right of the upcoming Broadway redesign uh, that uh, the DOT is proposing. And Broadway in Nashville is one of the major corridors for e-bike ride or e-scooter riding. And I think most people on the line can probably guess where most of the e-scooter riders are going to be in this case, and that's going to be on the sidewalk. So despite all of the messaging, uh, the infrastructure speaks volumes. Okay. So with that, we'll pass the mic uh, over. Um, there we go. So um, Rebecca. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the findings we had from the practitioner survey that we connect, uh, conducted as part of this BTS project that Chris was describing. And this was part of our information gathering that we wanted uh, to conduct in order to know how to develop the BTS toolkit and guidance and, and meet people's needs for their questions that they had. And just as a reminder, we started this project in 2019 and then the pandemic disrupted it. So some of the things that I'm going to talk to you about today, you may feel like, oh, well, in the last few years, we have a little bit more insight in that. And hopefully our work contributed to that. For the practitioner survey, we received 207 responses from a variety of individuals who represented a range of positions. So, for example, in the uh, graphic on the left there, you can see that we had a lot of folks from the transportation planning profession, a lot of folks from engineering, some folks from public health. We also had a range of responses from folks in different organizations. So the top line there represents cities, and this makes a lot of sense because cities are the places that are, you know, the sort of home or focus of the e-scooter programs. But we also had several folks from state DOTs interested in this. We also had um, folks from private companies, understandably, because uh, they were the of the folks who have the scooters. And then we had a, a lot of folks interested from universities um, who are you know, doing research on various aspects of e-scooter safety and other, uh, other parts of policy. Next slide. And what we did as part of the survey was ask about 70 different practices and approaches to e-scooter safety management. So just to kind of get a sense of who was doing what, what were the barriers to doing those various you know, types of management strategies. And we found a wide range of practices across locations and agencies. The most reported practices involved e-scooter operator regulations, policy making during the e-scooter vendor permitting stage. We also found safety communication and messaging to the public. And you know, Chris just showed an example of some of those um, you know, hang tags or flyers, for example, from Chicago DOT on the prior slide. Very few communities, in contrast, had clearly, clearly established vehicle speed management efforts safety and equity plans, e-scooter data collection and evaluation efforts, or emergency response plans in place to uh, support road user safety. So there was a variety, but we saw, you know, 
clearly more emphasis in some things uh, rather than others. I also want to note that um, these responses did match our understanding of e-scooter programs and the breadth of their covering at their coverings at the time, uh, but they did also likely reflect our survey respondents. For example, we had very few folks from law enforcement or emergency response as um, folks who participated in the survey. Next slide. So as part of our work, we really wanted to develop um, a framework that could establish safe system principles to, that could be applied by folks across various levels of you know, government, across the uh, private sector to help reduce e-scooter injury risk factors and increase those protective factors. And this is drawing from public health, this shared risk and shared protective factors framework. And these factors occur across multiple levels. So for example, we have the community level, which includes culture and policy. We have the, the environment, which is both the physical environment and the social environment. And then we also have the individual. And this is uh, this figure is not meant for you to try to decipher the small print. Don't worry, on the next slide, I'll show you um, a, a more sort of you know simplified version of this. Uh, but the, the idea here is that the risk and uh, shared protective factors identifying those and articulating them allows us then to develop programs and strategies to address them. And it's also important to note that the shared risk and protective factors are not just for e-scooter users. So a lot of the things that we see here are also applicable to pedestrians, bicyclists, and road um, and drivers, drivers and motorcyclists. And this is something that we see quite frequently in Vision Zero work and other safety planning efforts uh, that center on pedestrians and bicyclists, that if we address safety for the most vulnerable road users, we improve safety for everyone. And so by identifying these and looking for strategies to address the risk factors, increase those protective factors, we're actually going to increase safety and um, enjoyment of travel really for everyone. Uh, I want to note also that many of the practices that are most likely to provide protection for e-scooter users were those that were the least often reported. So I mentioned on the prior slide that, for example, there were very few speed management plans as part of e-scooter safety efforts even though we know that speed is the primary factor for injury severity. So if we can do more to you know, look at shared risk factors and address those, we're really going to move the needle for e-scooter safety and again, for other roadway users. And this is elaborated on in the toolbox where we actually give quite a bit more discussion related to these principles and also how they relate to evidence-based safety measures. If you can go to the next slide. So this is a simplified version of that graphic and just to kind of delve into a couple of these options. So for example, at the community level, we have our shared risk factors, including things like income inequality, neighborhood poverty or disinvestment, but also land use and roadways that are oriented to high speed travel. For risk factors at the environment level, we have stationary objects like pavement surface conditions that present fall hazards. And at the individual level, we have things like, you know, whether or not you're age 65 or older or health comorbidities. In the shared protective factor, uh, factors sections, um, at the community level, we have things like policies to improve equitable access to services and clear definitions, laws, staff data and funding to support e-scooter programs. And we were very fortunate to be joined by FHWA earlier in this webinar to articulate and tell us about how um, many more resources there are for e-scooter safety now than there used to be. Um, at the environment level, we have things like ample, comfortable space for e-scooter riding, specifically protected bike lanes and low-speed corridors. And this is a perfect example of something that, again, will benefit multiple roadway users. If you put in protected bike lanes, bicyclists are also going to benefit and pedestrians benefit from not having to you know, fight for or negotiate space on sidewalks with e-scooter users. At the individual level, a shared protective factor might be access to a safe place to learn to ride and then sufficient practice for that um, to build your skills. Um, I, well, I don't remember if Chris mentioned or not, but there is evidence in our work and in other folks' research that um, that experience level is significantly correlated with injury, likelihood of injury or injury severity. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, another thing that we tried to do through this work was to distill key takeaways for local micromobility program managers. And again, everything I'm talking about here is um, elaborated on in our toolkit and also in our final report. So this is just a really you know, high level overview. We had three uh, key issues here. Micromobility parking is a civil rights issue and a safety issue. 
micromobility programs will not succeed if riders, ha riders have bad experiences or are injured. And this kind of feels like a no duh takeaway, but the reality is that we've known that about bicycling for a very long time in this country, and yet we still undersupply uh, protected bike lanes in our cities on a routine basis. And the third key takeaway here is to, that we need to seek ways to mitigate harmful behaviors as well as to reduce harm when injuries do occur. So let's dig into those for just a minute, if you'll go to the next slide. So the first one, micromobility parking is a civil rights issue and a safety issue. So you all, if you've been involved with e-scooting for any kind of length of time, probably know that communities often receive a lot of complaints about improper parking. Interestingly, the evidence shows that oftentimes they are parked at a higher ratio than vehicle. They're properly parked at a higher ratio than vehicles in many places. And we probably shouldn't be surprised about this, right? That we kind of tend to give drivers and cars a pass and then we hold other modes to a much higher standard. So we have some places where scooters are parked properly 98% of the time, but we do also have places where they're propped in, uh, parked improperly quite a bit. And so we now have a lot more evidence about um, policies that are effective to help with proper parking. So we found parking compliance was much higher in cities with lock two policies and that's becoming more common and also places with established parking zones or corrals. Um, the final report provides more information on specifically injuries and complaints in relationship to poorly parked scooters. Um, but as you can see in these photos here on the left, you know, improperly parked uh, scooters not only present a tripping hazard, but they are really an infringement on the right of way, which we are required in the ADA to provide for, for all folks. So this is a key issue for us to address if we want e-scooter programs to be successful in our cities. Next slide. Uh, another thing that we need to do is plan for equitable allocation of parking infrastructure. So many of the parking management approaches are discussed in the final report in the toolkit. Um, and we have several case studies in there of cities who have done some really innovative things. So I hope that you'll find value in those. Um, some of these parking strategies include things like repurposing vehicle parking for e-scooter parking expansion. So you can see that in the picture on the left there where there's a, um, you know, what used to be an, a car parking space has been repurposed and is now a scooter, a scooter parking space. Um, we've done this also, you know, we've seen this before with uh, bikes, bike parking and bike corrals. We also see designated parking areas such as the photo on the bottom here on the bottom right where we have a parking that's co-located with a uh, a docked bike station. Um, and we also have examples of paint and corral based approaches. Um, some companies have also returned to rider incentives. So, um, you know, you get an incentive for parking correctly and some are pa pairing that with photo verification. You have to prove that you've parked the scooter correctly to be able to end your ride. We're also seeing some evolution in geofencing. And then again, those lock two policies as a really promising strategies for improving the parking problem. Next slide. Okay, so back to this one that I said was sort of a no duh. So micromobility programs will not succeed if riders have bad experiences or are injured. So we think that there's a lot of potential for e-scooter travel. Um, and we, we saw it take off in some cities, have a little bit more of a struggle in other cities. And then of course, COVID-19 disrupted everything. But as Chris showed in that uh, figure from NACTO, we are seeing e-scooters come back, make a resurgence. Um, but one of the things that we found that was consistent across the research studies in the beginning was that there was that relationship between injury propensity and severity and um, in e-scooter inexperience. So some of the cities have gone um, down the route of actually like creating spaces for people to practice riding e-scooters and get some experience so that when they're handling the e-scooter and learning how to use it, it, the first time that's happening is not while they're on the roadway potentially mixed with traffic or on the sidewalk potentially mixed with other pedestrians. There's, in other words, creating a safe space for people to learn that um, how to use the scooter and how to use it and make, make mistakes safely. And that would be you know, one aspect of the safe system approach, right, is that no injury should be so severe that we shouldn't create potential uh, for folks to make really terrible mistakes. We should have safety embedded within our system. And there are multiple layers for that so that if you make a mistake, okay, it's not that big of a deal. You weren't terribly hurt and you didn't terribly hurt someone else. Um, another aspect of this is that if people don't feel safe riding, they're not going to do it. And this is something that we've seen again for decades with bicycling. If you don't feel safe bicycling and you have any other option, you're going to choose that other option. So if we want e-scooters to be a viable mode in our cities, we do have to address those perceptions of safety as well. And a key part of that, if you want to go to the next slide, 
is to create these low stress bike networks. So those work for e-scooter safety and they also address those perceptions of comfort. And we discussed this in the final report that roads with separated or protected bike lanes are associated both with fewer e-scooter injuries and with crucially those lower rates of sidewalk riding and higher perceptions of comfort and safety among surveyed um, e-scooter riders. And this was very consistent across the research that people prefer to be where there is a bike lane. Um, they're riding on the sidewalk as sort of like a canary in the coal mine or a signal that they don't feel safe on the road. And for example, in Portland, they saw that when they put bike lanes on a street that didn't um, previously have them, the sidewalk riding decreased. So we know that uh, low stress bike networks are a key countermeasure for increased e-scooter safety and increased pedestrian safety by taking those e-scooters off of the sidewalk. And again, back to that sort of safe system win-win approach, they're also going to increase safety for bicyclists. So this is a key countermeasure that we want to emphasize as a, a core part of a successful e-scooter program going forward. And with that, I want to turn it over to Laura to talk more about the toolbox. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, as Rebecca and Chris just shared a lot of the key findings um, from the study, I wanted to expand upon where you can find a little bit more about what's been said. Um, one thing that we did produce, as um, Chris mentioned, the literature review, we were able to publish um, the findings from that a little bit early in a research results digest. Um, so we have that at a link as well as uh, the toolbox and the final report that includes a lot more information about all of the things um, and the methods that we used in this work. Um, so the toolbox though, I think is one thing that we hope to be very useful for folks um, at any level that they might be in thinking about safety within their micromobility program. It has some of those basic concepts that you may wanna use to share with other constituents or with your transportation advisory boards or other stakeholders. Um, but it also delves into some of those promising practices that we learned about through that um, stakeholder survey and um, as well as some tools to help with um, addressing some of the data limitations that we have. Um, so the, the toolbox, one of the things that you'll find there is a summary of different safety management practices um, with all the different realms of a safe system approach that um, Rebecca mentioned, we have a discussion on uh, different safety management approaches, who the typical agency lead is, um, as well as information that you can find to um, learn a little bit more about how to implement such a program. Uh, we also use the findings from our survey and literature review to identify what level of adoption was happening back when we were doing this work in 2020 and 2021. And also what we feel um, as researchers might be the, the um, strength of the evidence base behind such a practice. If, if any of you are familiar with NHTSA's countermeasures that work, you know, there's sort of a star rating on um, approaches that have a really strong evidence base and ones that are a little bit more novel or promising. And so we tried to uh, indicate that for the practices that we identified as well. The other thing that we wanted to do is continue to bring insight back to what a holistic program might look like and how to think about not just uh, individual safety approaches, but how do we combine that with a risk reporting system thinking about community engagement, thinking about equity, considering systemic problems across a network and how we might be able to address them in that systemic way and not necessarily um, chasing hotspots that we might find out about um, in our e-scooter um, you know, programs. And so um, we do talk a little bit, you know, as, as Chris mentioned, we understand a little bit more about some of the more common risks for injuries as well as for more severe and fatal injuries and ways that we can go about screening our roadway network to proactively identify such risks and especially to be able to either address them in the built environment or to communicate them more effectively to people who may be riding amongst those kinds of risks. And so what we put together in the toolkit is a risk assessment tool that can be used to engage uh, riders and non-riders alike to think about the environment and whether it's safe and inclusive for e-scooters. Um, this is something that could be integrated into existing programs that communities have. Uh, bike and walk clubs could use it, as well as agencies who might be engaged in performing road safety audits. 
Um, these questions could also be incorporated into more routine travel surveys uh, to help you get a baseline of issues that you could monitor over time. And so that's one tool um, that we offer to help folks um, start to understand some of their um, unique safety issues in their communities um, by collecting this kind of data. The other thing we recognized in the report and in the toolkit is that the data that we have is quite limited. Um, as, as you all heard, we don't have a really, um, you know, any existing standard for defining um, crashes and severity for e-scooter related incidents in our police reported data. A lot of that um, is not eligible for reporting because it didn't involve, um, it didn't meet the threshold for injuries or involving a motor vehicle. And so we have a lot of um, challenges in even understanding the magnitude of our injury burden. And so um, we still have a long way to go to think about how we can understand the injury outcomes as well as the, those exposure um, mechanisms that might be um, you know, creating opportunities for these outcomes to happen. And in the toolbox, what we tried to do is articulate the different principles of quality data, how important these data are for helping us to assess our challenges, prioritize our work and evaluate its effectiveness. And we lay out a number of different data sources available and um, specifically what kinds of data elements they may help offer. Um, recognizing that a community might have to work across many different data sets to sort of triangulate the bigger picture of what their safety concerns are. Um, so communities, for example, may be using that community checklist as an intercept survey, but they also may need to um, go out and collect a little bit of field data, uh, field data um, as well as think about uh, what data they may be able to gather from their mobility firm that might be um, available to them to think about both exposure or injury outcomes. And we also offer resources beyond thinking about the traditional um, sources of injury data. We know that FARS is um, pretty good about capturing fatal incidents, but there's still a lot of unknowns and um, uh, unknown uh, issues around uh, how we understand injury and even less severe crashes. So we offer links to toolkits like this um, that, that give us information on fatalities kind of in a dashboard style approach that we can see the big picture. Um, it's a tool for also reporting fatalities. But then we also, through our case studies, we offer examples of how communities are working uh, with healthcare data sources. And so um, we have examples in there of efforts to engage traffic record coordinating committees, as well as state and local health departments uh, to really tap into those existing injury surveillance systems uh, that may do a much better job of standardizing the way that they um, code e-scooter related crashes. And so um, hopefully by now you've seen a, an image of this micromobility modes and codes uh, poster. This is something that's been out for a few years now, um, but we talk in the report about how um, there are standardized codes available in the ICD-10-CM, which is the, um, the code book used by um, emergency departments and, and EMS folks to um, document injuries that they um, receive for medical attention. And the graphic here just shows an example of how um, by having these standardized codes in place, we could go back and look at um, what injury trends looked like before and after an e-scooter program was launched in Raleigh, North Carolina, for example. And so we know that there's some challenges there with accessing healthcare data, um, but we also have seen a lot of great breakthroughs and um, successes in the communities who are working to better understand their injury data by using these kinds of sources. Um, so in addition to talking about how we can overcome data limitations and uh, build upon that evidence base to implement solid practices, uh, we definitely cover a little bit about additional research needs. And I think a lot of these were um, shared at the time with the folks that, um, that the FHWA uh, presenters mentioned about developing kind of a research roadmap around micromobility. Uh, we understand that there's a lot of work to still be done to understand 
um, those experiences and attitudes and perceptions around safety. And um, as our data improve uh, for us to have more quality and, and more vigorous evaluations of different practices to know what's working uh, to improve not only um, injury outcomes, um, but those experiences and, and perceptions of safety. Um, and I know that FHWA mentioned a number of different equity related resources. Um, we definitely found that to be lacking when we were looking at the practices that were um, being uh, shared in our surveys. Uh, a lot of them really didn't have detailed um, or long-term findings on um, equitable outcomes. And so that's something we want to continue monitoring into the future and see how we can continue that community conversation and engagement uh, to learn more about what's needed and what's working. Uh, so just uh, beyond the Rebecca and uh, Chris team that's here today, I wanted to acknowledge some of the other folks that were part of this work. And uh, we're certainly happy to spend the rest of the time uh, responding to any other questions that the audience may have. Oh, I can't hear you, Sandra. Perfect. All right. That should work now. I just was saying, <clears throat> acknowledging the BTS 10 team and the FHWA team, um, great presentations. I'd like to invite everyone to come on the camera now so we can go through a couple of the questions that we got in the chat. Um, I think the first one that I'm going to go ahead and start off is with is we had a lot of questions discussing parking management that came from the second presentation, uh, specifically the technology and how that's developed in terms of micro mobility and parking management. Uh, a, a couple of people wanted to know if there's been any research or analysis done on utilizing vehicle parking spots as potential spots for micromobility parking as a way to free up space on the sidewalk. And then additionally, do you have any other studies where you found um, positive examples that people can look to um, in terms of compliance rates with parking? So I'll just toss that to the group. Chris, I'm thinking you may have some good examples on this, but I was just remembering a lot of the findings around not just having more parking, but having the parking located closer to um, the facility in which we want people to ride, having the parking off the sidewalk and actually in the street being something that we were finding to be um, a useful approach. Do you want to add on that? Yeah, I think just to piggyback on that statement, uh, the challenge uh, for a scooter rider is we say, don't ride on the sidewalk, don't ride on the sidewalk. And then we put park, we tell them to park on the sidewalk, uh, which means their trip starts on the sidewalk. They have to make a conscious effort to leave the sidewalk and get into some uh, presumably hostile mixed traffic environment. And then they we ask them to hop the curb or get back onto the sidewalk uh, later. Uh, and so um, I think that that's a, a really good point um, that we should stage people where we want them to start and stop uh, trips, uh, which would be in bike infrastructure or if we want them to share the lane. Uh, one, one point I want to make about this is that a lot of cities, when you have to allocate space like parking, uh, then you don't want to do it everywhere. And so cities have started to allocate space on street, uh, uh, taking parking spaces or maybe taking some, uh, uh, you might say, dead space from curb returns or site distance areas or whatever. But uh, keep in mind that these trips tend to be less than a mile long or much less than a mile long in some cases, uh, which means that if you don't have parking very close to the destination, like on every block face or something like that, then people probably won't adhere to it anyway. Okay. So there's a lot of uh, nuance on how you design a sort of parking corral, how many you have similar to bike share. They've got to be dense enough to, to matter for a rider on a short trip, um, but not too dense that they're effectively dockless if you want them to be that. Okay. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, next, I'll go ahead and ask a question. In your research, and particularly thinking about injury rates, do you have any observations to share about reported injuries of e-scooter riders as compared to other modes, such as shared bike systems or e-bikes? Yeah, 
We definitely had some material on that. Oh, Bronwyn, did you want to talk first? Sorry, you're muted there. No, sorry. Go ahead, Laura. Okay. Um, we did have um, some information on that in our literature review and our analysis of just one state's worth of injury data. Again, like I mentioned, we found that most um, states weren't actively uh, coordinating with their health department or their injury surveillance systems to look at that. Um, but we were fortunate that um, North Carolina is one of the states that, that does have um, sort of an ongoing data integration effort um, where we were able to look at injury um, rates by e-scooters, by pedestrians, and by bicyclists in um, five different cities in the state. So that analysis is in the final report. Um, and, and I can't remember off the top of my head the, the differences that we saw there, but I think the bigger challenge outside of, of North Carolina is um, making sure that if we're trying to compare injuries across different mode types, that we have that standardized definition of the injuries, um, because otherwise it's you're looking at apples and oranges. And a lot of what we've seen from the police reported data is misclassification. So e-scooters might be classified as a motorcycle, they could be come in as a bicyclist, they could come in as a pedestrian. Some states are moving to add um, a code of a you know person on a conveyance. And so that's the work that we have to do first is to clean up and look at and standardize our data so that we then have a better um, baseline for comparing injuries across those different modes. Perfect. And then Bronwyn, did you want to follow up on that? No, thank you. That was great, Laura. Awesome. All right. So I think next I'll move on to a question about a, an equity consideration that was voiced early in the in the webinar. Um, one individual wanted to know if there are any e-scooter or mobility devices that have been currently evaluated um, so that we can increase access for people with disabilities to use them. Uh, the examples given were three wheels, wider seats, wider bases, um, just to be more inclusive within the, the multimodal space. I'll jump in and say, I think we did look at that a little bit. Um, and we were curious to see how many programs were incorporating more accessible uh, forms of micromobility. Um, however, we didn't find a lot back at the time that we were working and we were also trying to pretty much narrowly focus on e-scooters. Um, but I think when we were thinking about equity, we were also thinking uh, more broadly than just the device. We were thinking about um, accessibility in terms of, is this um, a socially acceptable type of ride? Um, is a person going to feel safe and free from harassment on it? Is it affordable? Is it located in the neighborhoods that people are needing to go to? So we were thinking about equity um, from a number of different angles. Um, but certainly, I think we have seen a few communities look at, you know, trikes and other kinds of devices that may be part of their bigger equity program. And I'll just add. Oh. Oh. Go, go ahead, for it, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to say that some of the micromobility operators have uh, beyond trikes or sort of specially uh, designed accessible vehicles have included like seated scooters or added a seat. Uh, I don't know, some defunct ones now, but uh, basically you can add a seat to the deck of a scooter by attachment so you could be seated. So not, not uh, technically accessible, but certainly aiming for people at different levels of ability to balance on a scooter. Go ahead, Rebecca. And there are uh, some programs I'm thinking specifically of Portland's program by Town for All, which isn't e-scooters, but it does have, it's specifically focused on allowing differently abled people to have access to some kind of bike that would work for them. So it has multiple types of um, um, adaptive bikes in the fleet. And Portland is one of those cities that has really tried to incorporate equity throughout the RFP process when they solicit bids from various e-scooter operators. So 
I don't know, we're probably gonna talk about this at the end, but there was a second part to this webinar. And I hope that everyone who's on this call can attend that because that's where you're going to get to hear directly from some of the cities and the Portland Bureau of Transportation will be represented there. So on um, if you are able to come to that, I think that would be a great question to um, ask at that second webinar when you'll get to hear directly from uh, Jacob or Brian about how Portland is considering equity. They're certainly not the only ones, but they're the ones that, um, that I can think of most directly that have actually you know, incorporated some kind of physical infrastructure um, and equipment equity component very clearly in their process. Great, thank you. Um, this question pertains to data. So we received actually a few questions about data, specifically about the challenges in data and overcoming the data limitations that exist within the space. Some people were wondering if you could give more information about how we're getting data on e-scooter crashes and injury related outcomes. Um, specifically, what um, what efforts can be taken to to share the different data points that are coming from communities regarding what they have done to successfully collect and measure crash data? Okay, I can take a first pass at some elements of that question. You may have to repeat it um, again since there was a lot packed in there. Um, but I would say in our toolkit, we talk about sort of the big four, um, the big four sources of crash and injury data being um, police reports, uh, which, as I mentioned, will probably be best at capturing anything involving a car, um, but will miss 80% of the other incidents that might occur off road on the sidewalk or with only a single rider. Um, so police reports being one. Um, Emergency department data being the second one. Uh, again, if you're able to coordinate through your local or state health department, uh, they have the data with the ICD-10-CM codes that actually code a number of types of e-scooter injuries. Um, and that's where you can find out about any um, medically attended injury that came in through an emergency department. Um, the fourth or the third source that we saw a lot in our study was um, trauma registry data. Um, again, those are people who have much more severe injuries and get admitted to hospitals. So if you're interested in learning, let's say a little bit more about head injury outcomes and severe brain injuries, um, trauma data is a good source uh, for learning about those um, severe um, outcomes. And then the fourth source is um, EMS data. And again, EMS does not get called to the scene for every crash, but the value of EMS data is that they're very good in terms of time stamping and geolocating their data. So if you want to know where crashes are occurring and when on the roadway, um, that's a good injury data source um, that can often be kind of spatially linked uh, to your roadway data. So we talk about those four data sets in the toolkit and how to work with um, the data owners. And again, the data owners may be, you know, the trauma registry, it may be uh, your EMS, um, you know, hospital associations or your health department, uh, or it could be the DMV data. And usually it's the traffic records coordinating committee's role. They get funding from NHTSA. They bring those folks together to talk about how we can improve our data how we can improve our data standards and have consistency in how we code um, injuries. And so that's really um, the focus that we tried to um, lay out as a process in the report. And just to piggyback on that and highlight uh, the police crash data and the um, hospitalization uh, ICD-10 data are both kind of being updated now uh, or have been updated to include e-bikes, to include e-scooters. Uh, there's a new round of police crash data uh, coding that includes uh, e-scooters specifically. Um, there's questions about how to, uh, how to map uh, the typology that you saw in the early slides with actually what a, what a crash is, because remember all of the Orders are the first responders for the most part, and they don't, they're not all on this webinar. Uh, so having uh, some sort of labeling or something is one, one question that's open for the industry right now. 
along with another uh, a number of other strategies. Um, so, yeah, we're yeah. seeing that trickle through the police crash data. Tennessee has a pedestrian standing on a scooter as a person type, for example. But even with that label, it's not very consistently applied, let's say. And Sandra, I think the second part of the question was about how to gather that sort of information from the community as well. And I think that um, that audit kind of checklist tool that we talked about is one way that that could be integrated into community surveys or you know intercept studies with you know interviewing folks on the street to find out about their experiences, what risks are they seeing, have they had a bad experience. Um, and then to be able to compare that to other sources of data and see, um, you know, what kind of complementary information the community can provide. Great, thank you. So um, one question relating to mode shift. Um, we had presenters talking about micromobility and how it can help with mode sharing in terms of replacing car trips. Um, and helping with the last mile to transit options. Do you have any suggestions for further resources as to where um, to find those metrics and the types of other transportation modes or even trips that wouldn't be taken um, that they measure to determine that data? In our literature review that was published in as a rep, uh, research results digest, we do have a small sum sort of um, high level summary about trip replacement and the studies that we were able to incorporate into the literature review. Um, it does talk about how trip replacement comes um, to, you know, in some instances at the expense of walking and biking trips, um, but also almost in equal measure um, replacing car trips. And we didn't get at the time of the literature review a lot of detail about what kind of car trips were being replaced, whether they were carpool or, or otherwise. Um, but I think that is definitely a, a rich area for, for future research to help us better understand and better estimate the benefits um, from those um, substitutions. I would say just to add on to that, Laura, if, so folks, a lot of you're asking great questions. Thank you so much. And you're going to see like for me and Kristen and other folks answering the questions in the Q&A, a link to our report a lot of the time, just because as uh, Chris covered earlier, we reviewed almost 360 studies and reports. So it's just a vast and comprehensive uh, research review and it's a really good resource for you all and if you go and look at that you will see some studies where we do explicitly note that they were able to look at uh, trip substitution so for research that i did that we reviewed for example um, that i did prior to this work and then was reviewed we did ask about specifically what types of trips were substituted um, the survey in san francisco that the uh, city did of folks in the community asks about what they're substituting so there are some studies that do uh, are able to specify what types of trips are, um, you know, substituted for others. And then there are others like Laura saying that, you know, maybe more general. So hopefully you'll be able to check that out because it really is just a, an incredible amount of work, not only that our team did to synthesize it, but representing work across, you know, the professional spectrum from folks who are doing work in cities to researchers at universities across the world. It's just an, an incredible amount of um, value in that resource. Thanks, Rebecca. I would just also like to call out FHWA's CMAC Emissions Calculator Toolkit, which is um, now incorporating shared mic micromobility as part of that. So I can throw the link in the chat there as well. Thanks. Great. All right. And it looks like, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for the discussion portion of this webinar. I wanted to give a special thank you to all of our panelists and all of those who joined us today. Um, for the participants, Please keep an eye out on a follow-up email that contains all the details regarding the webinar archive. Um, it'll also give you access to the different sort of discussions that we had today. Um, our post-webinar survey and professional development credit information will also be within that follow-up email. We hope to see you for part two of this discussion, and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. <laughs>